we've seen that magnetic fields exert a force on magnetic poles, tending to align magnets with the magnetic field. It turns out that a magnetic pole is rather difficult to define in physics, so we actually characterize magnetic fields not by their effect on magnetic poles, but by their effect on electric charges. Magnetic fields apply forces to electric charges only when the charges are moving, it turns out. This diagram is showing a particle with charge positive Q moving to the right through a uniform magnetic field B that's directed upward. The direction of the force F on this charged particle is given by this cross product of the vectors QV and B, QV being the charge times the velocity of the particle. In this case, since the charge is positive, the charge times the velocity is in the same direction as the velocity, which is to the right. B in this diagram is up. The cross product, remember how to do cross product using the right hand rule. You curl the fingers of your right hand from the first vector, QV, so you point them along that direction, and then curl so that they point toward B, the second one. So if you do that, you'll see that the force QV pointing your hand to the right, and then B curling your fingers in the vertical direction gives you F, the direction of your extended right thumb, and that's going to be toward you, out of the screen. So again, this so-called Lorentz force, the force exerted by a magnetic field on an electric charge, is F, the force from the magnetic field, Q is the charge of the object, V is its velocity, and B is the magnetic field vector. This diagram shows another way of approaching the right-hand rule. I like to do curling from vector 1 to vector 2. This shows that if you orient the index finger of your right hand in the direction of vector 1, then the outstretched middle finger at right angles to it in the direction of vector 2, your extended thumb points in the direction of their cross product. You get index finger cross middle finger equals thumb. So let's characterize this magnetic force based on what we know about cross products. First of all, since the vector QV is one of the vectors in this cross product, if it's zero, if the charge is not moving, then this force is going to be zero as well. Furthermore, a cross product is zero if the two vectors are parallel or anti-parallel. So if the charge is moving parallel or anti-parallel to the field, the force is going to be zero. On the other hand, if the charge is moving in a direction perpendicular to the field, that's when the force has its greatest magnitude. The magnitude of a cross product is equal to the area of the parallelogram defined by the two vectors that you're crossing. That's going to be maximum when the two vectors are perpendicular when the parallelogram is a rectangle. Since the force is zero when the two vectors are parallel or anti-parallel, it's going to be non-zero in general. If the angle between the two vectors QV and B is defined as theta, then the magnitude of this Lorentz force is going to be QV times B times the sine of that angle theta. Also, if you just reverse either of those vectors, then that will reverse the direction of the cross product F. Magnetic field is expressed in units of the Tesla, which is named after the Serbian-American electrical engineer Nikola Tesla. So what is a Tesla? How do we decompose this unit? If F equals QV cross B, then the units have to be such that F in Newtons is going to be given by Q in Coulombs times V in meters per second times B in Tesla. So let's figure out what the units of this B have to be. If we have newtons given by coulombs times meters per second times tesla, well, we just divide both sides of this equation by coulomb meters per second. This is an improper fraction with a fraction in the denominator, so this turns into newton seconds per coulomb meter. It's often more convenient to express this coulombs per second in the denominator as amperes, so the tesla is often expressed as a newton per ampere meter. What about the direction of this cross product force. I like to use my right hand to figure out the direction of the cross product. Some students don't like that so much, so I've worked out a little mnemonic 
that they can use, and some students like to do this. I recommend you try this. If you like it, you can keep it. If you don't like it, you can just stick with your right hand. This is a very simple origami project, so you're going to need some origami paper for this. You can make your own origami paper just with a paper square, or if you have your own origami paper that you prefer, you can use that. Now you will need to write on this, so don't use something that's too busy. It's best if it's just blank. In fact, it's just fine if it's the same color on both sides. Just a square of white paper will do just fine. Here's what you do. You start with a paper square. Then you make three creases in it. Origami refers to mountain folds and valley folds. The way we're going to want to do this is to make two valley folds bisecting each side. So we have a valley fold going down this way and a valley fold going this way. So you fold the top to the bottom, then unfold it. Then you fold the left side to the right side and unfold it. Creases like that. First, the two valley folds. You fold uh, the left side over to the right side and crease. Then you fold the bottom up to the top and crease. Open it up and you're ready to do the mountain fold. Then you make one mountain fold that's creasing out along one of these diagonals. So you make a mountain fold from the center to the lower right corner. So you crease the right hand side to the bottom side, but you only crease the corner of the flap from the center to the edge. Unfold it and lay it back down. Now there are two valley folds pointing away from you, one vertical and one horizontal, and one mountain fold from the center to the lower right corner. Then to help you figure out where the vectors are going, you're going to mark arrows on the paper to show you where the vectors are. So we have the vector F, the Lorentz force, pointing up. You'll have the vector QV, the current, or the charge times the velocity of the charged particles, to the left. And then you're going to draw B, the magnetic field, pointing right. These vectors are not in the same plane. That's where the folding part comes in. You're going to fold this lower right corner. You're going to fold it to the corner on the lower left. You fold the mountain crease so that now this forms the corner cube and the three vectors are perpendicular to each other. I like to label the reverse side so that I can see what the vectors are no matter which way I'm holding the corner cube. I want to remind you also that we've used some vector direction conventions before when we're dealing with vectors in three dimensions. So we know how to express vectors to the right, left, up, or down. But how do we draw an arrow coming at you or an arrow going away from you? Well, left and right, obvious. Up and down, obvious. The vector going away from you, so into the screen, we're going to show the x. That's the fletchings, the back part of the arrow. If a vector is coming toward you, what you'll see is a point. And we describe that as a point inside a circle. So the in vector going away from you, you're seeing the back end of the arrow the out vector coming toward you, you're seeing the point end of an arrow. So let's practice this a little bit. If we have this magnetic field, B, expressed here as a uniform magnetic field directed to the right, and we have a positive charge moving down now in this direction, V, what's the direction of the Lorentz force on this charge? You can use your right hand. You can use your origami right hand. Pause the video now and see if you can come up with the answer. And the answer is F, the charge is coming at you. Now what about this particular case? Here we're showing two charges moving with the same velocity through a field, which is uniform, so they're both experiencing the same field. 
but in one case the charge is Q, in the other case the charge is 2Q. How are the magnitudes of the forces going to compare to each other? Pause the video, get your answer, and come back and check. The magnitude of the Lorentz force is just the magnitude of the cross product of these two vectors. The cross product of these two vectors is going to be the product of the magnitudes of the vectors times the sine of the angle between them. The angle between the vectors v and the vector b is 90 degrees. The sine of 90 degrees is just 1, so all we have to worry about is the magnitudes of the vectors themselves. qv for particle b is twice the value of qv for particle a because they have different q's and the same v. So the magnitude on a is going to be half of the magnitude of the force on b. Now here's a fun one to think about. We've got the same charge, Q, moving in the same direction, down, in the same uniform magnetic field, B, directed to the right. But let's imagine that this is what it's doing at one particular moment in time. At one instant in time, it's moving down through this field. We recall that the force acting on this is directed out of the screen toward you. How is this going to evolve over time if this is the only force acting on the particle, if there's no electric fields, if we don't worry about gravity, if no other particles are pushing on it? How is its path going to evolve over time? If it's accelerating toward you, that means its velocity is going to change from being purely vertically downward to being downward and toward you a little bit, so it's going to turn a little bit. What's going to happen to the force acting on it when that occurs? And what we find is the direction of the Lorentz force is going to change as well. It's going to stay being perpendicular to both B and QV. So the force is going to be, instead of directed purely at you, it's going to be mostly at you and a little bit vertically up. As its velocity becomes more and more toward you, the force acting on it is going to be more and more up, and it's going to follow a curved path. Not just a curved path, but it turns out that over time, this particle is going to trace out a circular path the force always being purely perpendicular to the velocity, you recall that's just the trademark of uniform circular motion, when the force acting on the object is always perpendicular to its motion. So the force is never going to do any work on the object. It's never going to change its speed. It's only going to change the direction. As the direction is changing uniformly in time, it's going to trace out a circular path. The magnitude of this force is always constant even though its direction is constantly changing. What if the instantaneous velocity of this particle is not quite perpendicular to the magnetic field? Well, we know that if it's parallel to the magnetic field, there's not going to be any force on it, and the charge will just move unimpeded. But what if it's just a little bit oblique, if most of it is perpendicular to the field, but it has some component parallel? Well, the cross product is going to be perpendicular to both the velocity and the magnetic field. At this particular instant, the direction of the cross product, the direction of this Lorentz force, is going to be straight out of the screen directed toward you. In other words, the component of the velocity that is perpendicular to the magnetic field is going to be changed by the acceleration due to the Lorentz force. But the component that's parallel to the field is not going to be affected. So we're going to have a combination of uniform circular motion in a plane that's perpendicular to the magnetic field and straight line motion parallel to the magnetic field. What is the combination of uniform circular motion and straight line motion? That combination is going to be helical motion. This particle is going to be tracing out a helical path in the magnetic field, where the axis of the helix is along the magnetic field lines. In this case, it's going to be tracing out a helix moving to the right. 